Support for Lab Out Loud is brought to you by the National Science Teachers Association. NSTA's next big national conference is just around the corner. It's in Los Angeles and starts on March 30th, 2017. And don't forget the upcoming regional conferences that will be held in the fall. There's one in Baltimore on October 5th. There's one in our neck of the woods starting on November 9th in Milwaukee. And one starting on November 30th in New Orleans. Find out more at nsta.org slash conferences. You're listening to the Lab Out Loud podcast, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. And today we're talking about the brain. When we talk about plasticity of the brain, that what our environment is and what we do actually determines the structure and health of our brain. We empower people. You're not born with one brain and you have to stick to it. But if you learn a foreign language, if you study a musical instrument, if you engage in new and challenging areas of research, all these things actually strengthen the brain. That's up next on Lab Out Loud. But first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. And, uh, you know, this has always been a podcast about science for science teachers, learning. And one of the biggest things that helps us learn is our brain. That's right. And uh, to help us understand more about our brain, we welcome Gary Weinberg to the show who has not only a lot to teach us about the brain, um, but also teaches us through a documentary he made. My name is Gary Weinberg. I am a documentary filmmaker, and my wife and I have been making documentary films for, oh, the last mumbly mum years, and we're making our first science documentary now. It's called My Love Affair with the Brain, The Life and Science of Dr. Marion Diamond. So what kind of documentaries have you made prior to this? Really all kinds. Uh, I'm an armchair fan of Darwin, so I like to promote diversity, and that's true in my own career. We have made heartfelt, universal human stories, such as the story of mothers and daughters, and then fathers and sons, which tells Mm -hmm. core human relationships. We've made very controversial political films. We've made films about U.S.-funded wars in El Salvador and Nicaragua, and we've made films about conscientious objectors in the Iraq War. Hmm. And we've made films for the super rich. We've made films for Forbes magazine, and we've made films for uh, a film called The Heiress and Her Chateau, a 100-year history of a 100-room mansion. So you've been doing this for a while. We've been doing it for a while, and it allows me to really see the vast difference of human experience on this planet. And that's what led me directly to science. If Hmm. anything can try to organize the incredible diversity and interestingness of human cultures and experience, it's science. And that led us directly to Marion Diamond and her wonderful career, both as an educator and then also as a research scientist. Well, before we get into that, I actually, I I have a little clip up. It must be her holding a a a brain in her hand. Indeed. Um, (laughs) That's on your Luna Productions website. But hands on science. Hands hands on right there. Uh, Before we get into that, though, uh, I'm really curious about your your going into science documentaries and and how is that different? Uh, how is it similar than other documentaries you've made? And why the transition? Uh, let me reflect on that for a second. Well, there's a small story of the transition, which is that our previous PBS documentary had been about the war in Iraq and conscientious objectors. So, the net effect of making that film really had an impact on me. And when we found the story of Dr. Marion Diamond and her amazing teaching of anatomy, the idea of making a documentary that celebrated anatomy as a life-affirming field of study felt so appropriate and so healing that I felt highly motivated to tell her study. And then the more I got to know her, both as a researcher and as a professor, I thought, oh, literally millions of people need to know about her, with an especial emphasis for people in science education. She's such a shining role model, well, especially for women and girls, but truly for everyone, about what it means to have a life in science, a passionate, rewarding life in science, which is why we ended up with a non-traditional science film title, My Love Affair with the Brain. You know, I would challenge anyone to find another science film with the word love in the title. Um, So tell us a little bit more about Dr. Marion Diamond. Well... Perhaps her number one claim to fame is when she put her 
Anatomy Lectures on YouTube at, back in 2005, and she has gotten 1.7 million views of those Anatomy Lectures from then till now. Uh, in 2010, it, was, it made her the second most popular college professor in the world. I think oh, wow. she's now slipped down to number five, merely the fifth most popular college professor in the world. And what you see in that is an amazingly engaging personification of how to do science education. For those of you who have studied anatomy, it can be as dry as dry can be. It can be like reading tax laws. You know, it's a list of terms and functions and structures. Mm -hmm. So to bring that to life is an incredible achievement. And literally for decades, she was the most popular teacher at UC Berkeley where she taught. So we encountered those first and were truly inspired by them. But briefly, some of the other areas that her research went into, which I hope we get to talk about, is she is the very first researcher in the world, and by the way, I should say, she and her team were the first researchers in the world to find hard evidence of plasticity in the brain. Um, I'll define that, although if science educators are listening, I hope they all know what it is, but it used to be believed that the brain was determined at birth by genetics. You know, yes, it would grow and learn, but the capacity and abilities of the brain were determined by genetics, and nothing could be learned or changed based on behavior or environment. Um, Marion Diamond and her team were not the first ones to think that that was not correct, but they were the first ones to find hard evidence in a study of rat brains, and really, it's a decisive demonstration of the plasticity of the brain, and created, or rather helped to create, modern neuroscience. So she is a tremendous pioneer in science, and it is my own personal opinion that if she were a man, she might have won the Nobel Prize for it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm also subjective. Yeah. I really like that woman, <laughs> so you know, feel free to throw stones at my opinion. I, I'm, I'm emphasizing that. So how did you meet her? Well, really, it was coming out of the painful experience of making a film about conscientious objectors and feeling like oh, okay. we didn't want to talk about anatomy only in terms of death and destruction, but we wanted to celebrate the human experience. Almost and like a documentary cleansing. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I have that luxury. And, you know, it's my personal belief that a lot of teachers are able to teach well because they themselves have had moments of feeling like the lack of knowledge made a difference to them, and therefore they want to bring it to others. I mean, maybe that's naive and idealistic, but that's how I feel about teachers, is great people who bring us knowledge. I get to do the same thing on the scale of television, and sure. it's very that's rewarding. So you, you mentioned her other research you'd like to get to talk Are there some highlights uh, that we should also know about her other research? Yes, absolutely. She made a study on Einstein's brain that was the first study ever published on Einstein brain, and it was both interesting in its you know, primacy and then also in what it found. So by the primacy, I mean, in hindsight, it seems so obvious that if you're interested in brains, one would want to study Einstein's brain. I mean, hello, would each of us think of whose brain we want to study? He's got to be the top of the list for all of us. Mm -hmm. So the fact that no one had done so is sort of amazing, and it's a tribute to one of her gifts, which is the ability to ask important questions. Because I think one of the essences of science is asking important questions. Because you'll never get a meaningful answer unless your question is a good one. So she had a gift. And it led her to being the first one to study her, his brain. And she found out that he had more glial cells than the average human being. Hmm. So the revolution in understanding glial cells I think it was Scientific American who listed it as one of the 10 greatest stories of the decade. But it's really been another paradigm change. And for those who are not familiar, allow me to do a documentarian's armchair quick description of what that means, uh, with apologies for my lack of Yeah, I was about to say, education. what's a glial cell? <laughs> okay, so the brain is composed of two cells, neurons and glial cells. And oh. neurons are the sexy ones. They have electrical impulses. You know, you can study all the those credit. with all sorts They're the of things. celebrities of uh, the brain cells, basically? Right, exactly. And the glial cells are the Cinderella cells. They're, they're the ugly stepsister. Traditionally, they were viewed as just the helper cells that do the cleaning up of the brain, the getting out of the toxins, the moving all that blood around, the very dull stuff. And some people say that the cliche, which we know is not true, but the cliche that 80% of your brain does nothing, well, 80% of your brain is glial cells. So mm. 
that is a slander against the noble glial cell that has gone into popular culture, which is simply not true. Not only is it not true on the face of it, but what we have learned over time is that glial cells are also involved in the act of communication between cells. So, for example, there's a wonderful study in, in 2010 about how glial cells communicate through a calcium network. I mean, who knew that calcium could be used to send signals? So, I will exaggerate a little bit because it's a science show. I'm careful to be mm-hmm. clear when I'm exaggerating. It's possible that they are involved in cognition then. It's possible that they're doing the acts of thinking. Uh, that's an ambitious claim. We know for sure they're involved in the act of communication, which is pretty much all we know about the brain anyway. We don't know where thinking occurs. You know, what is a thought? What is the cellular mechanism that mm-hmm. describes a thought? Well, all these questions are kicked into high gear by a very controversial study that Dr. Diamond does on Einstein's brain. Because Einstein's brain is a perfect hook for both the popular press and for educators to bring up something of interest. And if there's something unusual there that sparks our additional study, like the higher ratio of glial to neurons, well, how worthwhile that is. So besides the the research that you found here, too, it it sounds like you tried to tried to portray Dr. Uh, Marion, and and it doesn't sound like you really had to to try that hard, but uh, try to to basically tell her story of how science works and how she actually goes about doing science. Is that correct? Not only is that correct, that's sort of central to what we're doing, and it's central to part of the discussion that I am so anxious to have with science educators. So the difference between our film and, let's say, a typical PBS Nova is... We focused on biography, and through that revealed the science that Dr. Diamond investigated and explored. The fact that she's a great teacher makes it especially easy, and we included that as well, of course. But most contemporary coverage of science in the media, be it television or print, what does it focus on? State-of-the-art breakthroughs, new advances. Well, that's very exciting and so worthwhile, but there's a negative result that also occurs. One thing is, is state-of-the-art has a very limited shelf life. Mm -hmm. And when there are things like paradigm change, all that media coverage is then simply wrong because there's a new advance that disproves the old. And then secondly, if you do coverage of breakthroughs, science becomes a series of snapshots one-off things, one right after another. So if I'm a normal citizen and in one year I read that drinking coffee is bad for me and in the next year I read that drinking coffee is good for me, have I learned anything about science other than that it is confusing? Mm. No. My knowledge is not furthered by the one-at-a-time study of these things. Biography is different and it introduces the human element to the scientific method. I think, uh... And this is important in so many ways. I think recently the the new Nova, or not new Novas, um, Cosmos, the new no- Cosmos with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, those were very biographical. Well, and actually, the in 2011, Nova did put out what Darwin never knew, and that series, I love that series. The the first main piece is is basically going through Darwin's life, and it was much more about the human element as he was going through figuring out the his theory of evolution and also the challenges and the you know the the process that went to it and in his real life struggles as well i mean to me yeah. that that was more powerful than just you know what is evolution and how does it happen and cosmos did it with animation i think excellent and told the human stories too and it's an excellent way for an audience and makes sense for us to connect to Gentlemen, you are voicing my very argument by pointing out exceptions to it, and and I'll (laughs) add one more because I agree with you, and that is the history of science is largely organized around biography. Mm -hmm. So when we think of gravity, we think of Galileo's experiments, not just the experiments, but the man himself. And we don't talk about the universal law of gravitation. We talk about Newton's laws. And, you know, in math, you know, Many people are familiar with Archimedes and his math, but perhaps the single most famous story is of his murder by a Roman soldier. He's drawing calculations in the sand, and he's so engrossed in the calculations that he doesn't realize that a life-threatening Roman is giving him orders. He's like, (laughs) don't erase the circles. I'm working on something. (laughs) You know, that shows you how profoundly persuasive and relevant math is 
that for him it was more important than a life-ending threat. So, you know, I think we're all agreeing on the place for biography, and I'm not suggesting I'm the only one, by all means. But it's a delight to practice it specifically in a contemporary way, to not just have the old dead scientist's life stories told, but a living one, and that makes her role model for all of us that much stronger. I also uh, remember yeah. reading uh, Richard Rhodes' uh, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, and, and that also injected quite a bit of, of you know, biography into it as well, the, the story and the politics behind everything that else was happening, along with the science, too. And, yeah, you got me. I, 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 do, a, I do appreciate that kind of uh, narrative and storytelling in science as well. So as this is a, a documentary, a science documentary, and, and I imagine there's probably a little bit of um, artistic license that you have when doing a documentary – do you run into problems when you're dealing with it in terms of science? Because, well, it's science. Let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, one of my biggest fears, if not the biggest fears, was that I would make some factual or scientific error. So, thank you. Yeah, heavens, how did you avoid sub- that? Well, the subject of my film is one of the great teachers and science educators in the world, in my humble opinion, not to leave anyone out, but to nominate her into that pantheon. And I am sure Dr. Diamond has seen this film a hundred times. Every time I had a problem, I would bring it to her. And to her amazing credit, for example, if I would put together a scene that was excessively personal, for example, one afternoon I filmed with her while she was making Thanksgiving pies for her family. It was a marvelous opportunity to talk about the scientist who had inspired her in her youth, and why women scientists make good cooks in following recipes. And, you know, just a a marvelous, wide-ranging discussion. So I edited it down to 15 minutes, and she looked at it, and she said, oh, that'll be 10 seconds in the finished movie. (laughs) So not only was she a good scientist, but a a good critic. And and by the way, she was exactly right. It turns into 10 seconds. (laughs) And then also we had some wonderful scientific collaborators. Um... Uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, was is a, a collaborating partner, not an official one, but you know very much on board. And they they appointed a science advisor for us. You know, we talk to other people, and you know, as you know, science changes. So some of the things that happened over the course of making this film for five years were wonderful. There's new technologies of visualization of the inside of the brain that are included in the film, some of which come from a wonderful lab in Harvard that, you know, literally were recorded in June. So, you know, they're less than six months old. You know, those images Mm. didn't exist when we started the film five years ago. Has Dr. Diamond seen those? And if so, what did she think? Oh, she loves it. I mean, she is now a retired professor, but deeply engaged in science education. That is truly her life's work, perhaps even more than her research. So, When people ask her now as a retired person what she's doing, she says, well, I'm working on this film. And that's no exaggeration. Uh, It couldn't have been made without her or her scientific husband, who is sort of the poet laureate of the brain. He contributed one line, which I'm so anxious to share, because it's sort of the essence of why I think this film is good for science educators. When we talk about plasticity of the brain, that what our environment is and what we do actually determines the structure and health of our brain. We empower people. You're not born with one brain and you have to stick to it. But if you learn a foreign language, if you study a musical instrument, if you engage in new and challenging areas of research, all these things actually strengthen the brain. So Dr. Diamond's husband contributed the line, your own personal masterpiece, your mature brain. Hmm which is so poetic. Yeah. And, and then in a science education context, when you play it in front of groups of students, and we have tested it extensively, to see them shaking with excitement that they're carrying a personal masterpiece between their ears and come up to afterwards and say, you know, now I know what I want to do. I want to learn more about the brain. And their teachers are like nodding and winking and saying, maybe the next Marion Diamond. That's actually why we made this film. I mean, true, We are professional documentary filmmakers, so my professional task is to put it on television. Yeah. So when can we see this on television? Yes. Well, uh, PBS is an odd animal, so it's a complex question, but half of the United States will be able to see it on March 9th on prime time on PBS World. 
Uh, and all the rest of PBS will have a scattered array of dates. So, for example, I live in San Francisco. Here it will be on the air on March 22nd. Okay. So if this is too confusing for people, they can go to myloveaffairwiththebrain.com mm-hmm. and poke around. We have a list of all the PBS stations that we know of and when they're broadcasting it. But it's, it's going to be out there evermore. And, of course, we'll put links to that in our show notes. For okay, thank show. you. Thank you. Gary, before we let you go, um, you had mentioned a little bit about wanting to have some conversations with science educators about your work with the film and, and what it means. Um, can you share a little bit about what that might be? Conceptually, the main points are things that we have been discussing already, the importance of including biography in science education and the importance of presenting role models of living scientists that people studying science can identify with. So those are conceptual important things that I I would like to share with others. But as a practical matter, I'm very concerned that education through television alone is so limited. It's really conversation and work on the part of a viewer or a student that makes their mind change and improve. So what we're trying to do is to put together a program of making the film available in the schools and combining it with speakers. Mm. Now, for example, that could be the teacher of a class with a study guide. Mm But it could also be a local scientist who comes in and shows up. So we are currently putting together a whole program for this, and we have a number of science organizations that are considering being our partners with this. None have committed, so I can't start throwing their names out. But yeah. you know, I think all scientific educators know that experience when the light bulb goes on in a student's brain and how deeply satisfying that is. With Dr. Diamond, I saw that happen in real life literally hundreds of times. And we knew the film was getting to where it needed to be when it started to happen through the video as well. So when I witnessed the light bulb go on in the brain of a student watching this film, you know, my inner dialogue is, is, my work here is done. You know, it's like (laughs) I'm so satisfied. But my work isn't done. You know, that's part of why I'm on this show is, is I really want to reach out to science educators and let them know how available it's going to be, and that we're engaged in the work of making that happen. So now I'm glad you mentioned, you know, the light bulb going on, because when I think of sometimes science films in the classroom, the light bulbs always go off, right? And uh, But I'm glad you mentioned, too, I want to, you'd like to hear that there's conversations happening. Uh, and I think sometimes, you know, as a science educator, when I was always showing a film, and maybe it's like a 50-minute documentary or something, um, it would take two to three days because... I would stop it and we would talk or we'd have a discussion when there was a, a poignant moment within within that you know piece of film there that I, I thought we, we really need to, to dive into this a little bit more. And so, uh, again, something that may have taken a half hour would extend you know into hours because of that. And I think that that's an important piece of science education there as well. Yes, and I agree with you. So what we did in that regard is, is that the film is – not entirely segmented, but it has chapters that are friendly to stopping and discussing, organized by theme rather than by chronology. So, for example, chronology is useful in pure biography, but if you're really interested in science education, biography should be a powerful element, but not the ruling element. The ruling element should be the themes of science. So the first part of the film is all about the scientific method and how paradigm change takes place in the specific example of Marion Diamond's research, which set up the new paradigm of brain plasticity. And, of course, it's a very dramatic story. She was a 31-year-old woman who gets shouted down at a science convention by the grand old men of the field saying, mm-hmm. young lady, the brain cannot change. And of course, I always think when I, when I hear her telling that story, it's like, well, that old guy's brain couldn't change, but the rest of ours could. <laughs> well... <laughs> I, I really look forward to, to seeing this film now, now that I know a little bit more about it. So we, we look forward to, uh, to sharing this with educators and hope that they are able to find ways to use it in their classroom. Oh, I feel the exact same way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, Gary. Thanks much, Gary. For links and other information related to this episode, visit laboutloud.com. You can send us your questions and comments at laboutloud.com slash contact. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you've subscribed on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting platform. And if you really enjoyed it, consider leaving us a rating or a review. Your feedback helps others find our show. Until next time, I'm Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell.